Hello, you're watching World Talks, where every word matters, and I'm your host, Sasha Farbach. More support for Ukraine has been pledged by NATO allies as all 32 member states gather in Washington, D.C. Yet how fast will these pledges become a reality? As the alliance marks 75 years since its inception, it is also the most dangerous time for the transatlantic bloc, with an aggressive Russia continuing its illegal war on the European continent. There's also the question of leadership, in particular from Europe, as several leaders have arrived politically bruised, namely President Macron of France and Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Let's analyze the latest from the NATO summit now with our next guest. I'm joined by Daniel Hamilton, President, Transatlantic Leadership Network. Good to have you on the program. Thank you. Now, in terms of we're looking for, for achievements, we've already had quite a speech last night by President Joe Biden. Uh, I want to show a clip of that because it's important to hear what he said, namely about my next question. So let's roll that for you and our audience. Uh, welcome to the 2024 NATO Summit. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to host you in this milestone year to look back with pride at all we've achieved and look ahead to our shared future with strength and with resolve. Nearly two dozen allied partners have signed a bilateral security agreement with Ukraine, and more countries will follow. Today, I'm announcing the historic donation of air defense equipment for Ukraine. The United States, Germany, the Netherlands, Romania, and Italy will provide Ukraine with the equipment for five additional strategic air defense systems. And in the coming months, the United States and our partners intend to provide Ukraine with dozens of additional tactical air defense systems. The United States will make sure that when we export critical air defense interceptors, Ukraine goes to the front of the line. So those were the words of President Biden last night. So clearly positive, very positive signal in terms of new air defense systems coming from various countries. Now, the question is to you, Daniel, was this already planned? Was this something that this has been discussed before the summit? Or was this a simple reaction to those terrible airstrikes that we saw uh, in Kiev at those children's hospitals? And when will these arrive? That's the next question. Right. No, this has been long in the planning. It's part of a larger alliance package to support Ukraine that's been in the works, you know, for some months. And the summit is supposed to conclude many of these uh, arrangements. Uh, the, the advanced air systems that the president is mentioning should be coming soon. He mentioned the other package uh, in the next few months. I think the main point is that with the funding unlocked in the United States uh, uh, in the Congress, and now uh, commitments by the European allies to support Ukraine, including with new funding measures, you'll see a steady stream of continued military support. The other element from the summit is NATO is taking over the coordination of military assistance and military training for the Ukrainians away from the US-led informal so-called Ramstein group, uh, which puts the alliance you know, front and center in terms of continuing to maintain this stream of military support for Ukraine, including weapon systems that could strike into Russia. Mm -hmm. And also, I want to bring up leadership because, I mean, there is concern that's one of the elephants in the room. It's not just President Biden. It's also politically a weaker France, uh, a weaker Germany even, uh, but also new allies as well. Of course, we have now uh, Sweden and Finland in the alliance. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Because I think uh, we, we're looking at 75 years of unity here, but at the same time, there are those in the alliance now with political leadership as well. I mean, this is a challenge. How, how do you see this impacting what's done at the summit? Well, I think that one of the goals of the summit, and I think it's a great achievement for President Biden, is to show that NATO allies are unified. 32 countries uh, consensus agreement on their next steps to support Ukraine, to uh, build up their own defenses, to, to do forward deployment of forces, and to Im improve the alliance's ability to uh, have rapid reaction forces to the eastern flanks of NATO. All of these things have moved forward in the last couple of years. There are always, you know, every every democratic state in NATO has its own electoral politics, so uh, we always are going through that. Mm -hmm. 
but I think the, it's a tremendous display of unity here in but, Washington. Uh, but I have to say, days. a tremendous display of unity. I mean, that, of course, it sounds good. And of course, it's 75 years that we can laud certain achievements. But we have one particular country, if we look at uh, Mr. Orban, who very much seems to have negotiated his very own exception to NATO in the last few weeks. It seems that he has a special arrangement in NATO. Uh, we have Turkey very much supplying Ukraine with drones and support, but at the same time still uh, very close to Russia. So uh, unity here seems uh, maybe not the, the right apt word here. I mean, is the alliance as united as the politicians say that it is, or are there serious cracks on this anniversary? I don't think there are cracks. Uh, uh, Hungary has carved out its own particular position, but the alliance has managed to account, take account of that and not have Hungary hold anything back. Uh, Prime, uh, you know, Orban is going to sign all the agreements in Washington. He's not, he's not stepping aside. He's not blocking anything. Turkey has always played a particular role within the alliance. This is nothing new. Uh, it is supporting Ukraine, even though it has arrangements with Russia. But that that's nothing new. This has been going on for ever since it joined the alliance itself. So these are just the dynamics of managing an alliance of 32 different countries. I think the alliance is remarkably unified, and we have actually Vladimir Putin to thank for that. Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, I mean, the alliance has grown. As, as we know, we have now 32 member states. The Nordic states came in. Uh, they wanted to join quicker, but again, uh, I challenge you on unity. I mean, it took much more time to have Finland and Sweden join. There was a lot of pushback, again, namely the same characters, Mr. Orban, Mr. Erdogan holding that up. Yes, they agreed, but uh, could have been done a lot faster. But also, let's look at the core allies as well. Uh, if we're looking at Canada falling short of that 2% target, uh, already receiving a bilateral letter from U.S. senators very much complaining about that fact. Spain, Italy, two major countries in Europe still falling short of 2%. Uh, is this the, the summit where we'll have spenders like the US and Estonia and Poland finally get everyone up to that 2% marker? Collectively now, Europe, the European allies collectively meet the 2% of GDP spending on defense. Not everyone does, so there are laggards. Poland and Baltic states are ahead of the game. Um, and, you know, we welcome that. But, uh, again, if you look at historically, just a few years ago, there were only three or four allies that were meeting that goal. At, when President Trump left office, there were only nine that did that. Now, under President Biden, there are 23 that meet the 2% goal. Uh, and that includes countries like Germany, which have struggled. Uh, so uh, I think the trajectory is clear. I think this is becoming the recognized floor expectation for all allies to get to that 2%. Even a country like Spain, which is you know, lagging, doesn't dispute the commitment. It's simply you know, hard for it to get there according to its politics. So I think if you look at overall NATO spending, it has ramped up remarkably uh, in the last number of years. And again, we're managing this. Some would say 2% is the ceiling. We should raise the ceiling, I mean, raise the floor uh, to 3% 3, 3 perhaps. Poland is even spending more. I would support you know, raising that floor. Um, but you understand the politics in many European states. It's, uh, it's always a work in progress. Canada is clearly a problem. And uh, that's on the North American side of the, of the alliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also in terms of how worrying is it that we have uh, problems currently in France? I mean, uh, very much uh, not so much the rise of the right, but very much stagnation politically in France. Uh, also the same in Germany to an extent. I mean, that coalition government has never really accelerated decisions. Uh, so how much is that going to be a liability when potentially we have uh, a new administration in the White House uh, later on in the year? Well, I think the real issue will be the election in the United States. I think in France, <clears throat> this will be uh, you know, a difficult political season for the French. They don't really have a clear way to a clear, you know, decisive uh, government. Uh, and so they will kind of just have to, you know, fight that out. The Germans don't face an election till next September at the latest. They could do it earlier, but there are constitutional reasons why that's hard in Germany. 
the government, despite lagging often, has never questioned its commitments in NATO. It has stepped up its defense spending considerably. It's it's moving in the right direction, even though it has many, uh, you know, historical legacies which are preventing that debate from happening the way maybe Polish or U.S. colleagues would want. Uh, but I think the real question mark is in the United States, whether we will have a different administration in November uh, and elected and then come to term office in January. Uh, if it's President Biden again, you would see he's the most transatlanticist president we've ever had in the U.S. history, and his legacy clearly is to solidify the alliance. And he is not backing away from his commitment to Ukraine or to NATO. President Trump, as you know, has questioned the value of NATO. He is calling privately for the U.S. to be on standby, whatever that means, uh, within the alliance. That means you might not be able to count on the U.S. for uh, defense guarantees. Um, and he is, of course, pushing the alliance to, uh, you know, alliance countries to do more on spending. But so is the President Biden. And President Biden has actually achieved more in that spending targets than President Trump ever did. Mm. But at the same time, I think uh, one of those things that we could debate this for a long time is that I think Trump hasn't come out directly and said anything that we should stop supporting Ukraine. I think there was a tweet on his own social media, I think back in April, where he did say actually Ukraine's sovereignty, that that's a win for the United States. So I think there is a lot of rhetoric that doesn't make sense what he says, but I think he hasn't actually gone and said that we should stop support. We'll see if that even happens. We don't we don't know that. Uh, I just want to know one quick thing. We're, I'm conscious of the time here. Just really briefly, we're hearing about this bridge to membership for, for Kiev. We're hearing things about a NATO representative station in Kiev. Um, I mean, we've, we've heard this since the last summit. How tangible will we get to uh, membership, an offer of membership for, for Ukraine? Probably not at this summit. What's your takeaway after these, these days conclude? There's simply no consensus when the alliance for Ukrainian membership. That's the reality. You don't want to invite a country not certain of your own ability to follow through on that commitment. So we're not there yet. So what the alliance is doing is, is they call this bridge uh, to integration into Euro-Atlantic structures. The debate right now, you call it irreversible or not, nothing's really irreversible. So I think that's more symbolism. But so you have to look at what's happening on the ground. As we said, the alliance is providing renewed financial support to Ukraine. All of those legislative packages have gone through, uh, and that will that'll hold the alliance at least this year in terms of support for Ukraine. In terms of military, direct military support, it is ramped up, and it is including now uh, capabilities that could strike into Russia. The qualms allies had had about that have dissipated. Uh, and NATO has taken over this military training and coordination mission uh, itself, so that's a big step up. Uh, it is working with the European Union and with other countries to work on Ukrainians own, Ukraine's own you know, internal transformation so that any concerns about corruption, any concerns about Ukraine's ability to sustain its own democracy are resolved before the question of membership would ever arise. You don't want to appear before the US Senate and not be able to answer those questions. In the United States, you need 67 out of 100 senators to vote for Ukrainian membership. I'm not sure there are, the votes are there at the moment, nor in some other uh, NATO countries. I was involved in Poland's accession to NATO and so on. And the, you know, the basic political point here is when you invite a country to membership, you already want to know what the answer will be when your parliaments have to ratify. And I don't think we know the answer yet. So we have homework to do, so do the Ukrainians, but I think there is a general sense we have to do this and move forward. All right, indeed, there's much more work ahead, that's for sure. Look, we'll conclude it there. Thank you so much, that was Daniel Hamilton. Really appreciate all your insights today. Thank you so much, bye. And thank you for watching, that was TVP World and World Talks, but there's much more coming up, so stay tuned, goodbye.